I did a most downloaded episode, I believe for year two, and everyone seemed to really enjoy it, including me. So I figured we'd do it again, as year three is just wrapped up. As with the last compilation I made, these are not necessarily my favorite episodes of the year, but they are the most downloaded of the year. And I think the top three even broke download records by quite a bit, so it's clear that people enjoyed them. This is a great way to peruse topics you may have otherwise overlooked or ignored, or great starting points if you're new to the show. I'm also super proud to say that this has been a massive year of growth, with numbers doubling and tripling in most cases. Along with an astounding 160 country reach and numerous top rankings in multiple countries and on several platforms. Starting us off at number 10 is Bad Bosses with Jennifer Nash. We originally arranged this interview to talk about good bosses, but you all in the audience quickly decided you wanted it to be about the worst of the worst, and what's wrong with them. I'll also throw in a little... So you know that there's a clean cut in between the audio segments, as we're not going to air the entirety of all of these interviews. That would be an insanely long episode. When I was doing my my research um, on leaders and what made you know outstanding leaders differentiated them from average leaders in organizations, you know the outstanding leaders would often tell me they didn't think of themselves as a leader. They didn't consider themselves to be a leader until someone else actually assigned that title or that identity to them. And it was so interesting to me to hear that because I thought, wow, like where is that actually coming from? But I think some of these abilities that these people had that made them outstanding are things that just came naturally to them, you know, that were intuitive to them. It wasn't something that they had to learn Um, And I think for people who are, you know, not in that outstanding category of leader, I think there's always an opportunity for you to move from where you are to become better. Um, But it takes some some work at some of the competencies that maybe you aren't as skilled at. And so I think what catapulted these other leaders like right into that outstanding category was that they were already innately good at these certain things that help them lead people effectively and drive results in organizations. So if you're getting this report back and you're the leader, what are some of the worst things you could see on this report? (laughs) Some of the worst things. Uh, Well, I will preface this by saying that the leader um, may not have the self-awareness that they could have or should have um, prior to getting this report. So one of the worst things they could see is that people don't like them, that they're not effective that they don't treat people uh, fairly or equitably, that they aren't supported, you know, in their position with the vision that they have. Um, You know, they may get some very personal feedback, you know, where respondents share something about them on a personal level, not just a professional level. And so sometimes those comments can be very hurtful and very, uh, disheartening, if you will. I've had some leaders tell me when they get their 360, you know, and I would go through it and read it. uh, And, you know, they would tell me that they, they just started crying when they read it um, because they were so upset by what people were saying. Um, I've had other leaders tell me that, you know, they've gotten a 360 and it was the first time that they'd ever heard anything like that, that was on that report. And, you know, in my book, I talk about, you know, the example of John where he gets his report and he finds out that like people perceive him in a completely different way than he perceives himself. And in some ways that could be the worst type of response that you get, because then you now are aware that the way you are being perceived in the organization is not how you thought you were being perceived. And that creates an identity gap. And then a decision of now that I have this information, what do I do with it? You know, where do I go with this? This is like changed my world and turned it upside down. How do I deal with this? And as we were prepping for this, I had read something that really stood out to me where they had said, you know, most people quit bosses more than they quit their jobs. And I thought that was like a really strong point to be like, it's, you know, it's not necessarily that you have a terrible job. It's just that your leadership becomes like unmanageable. Exactly. And we know that from research. People leave bosses. They don't leave organizations. 
you know, I can speak from personal experience. I left my last position because of, you know, the the leader that I had there. I have had other people come to me and tell me that, you know, they, you know, they just, the boss is making their world untenable. They can't deal with it anymore. Um, they feel that it's toxic and they want to leave. And, you know, organizations aren't comprised of people. And the people that we have the most often and the most frequent touch points with are the people who shape our perception of that organization. So when we don't like working for the boss that we have, or we're asked to do things that may not be proper or appropriate, and we aren't, we don't feel that we're valued, you know, by our bosses, it, it can have devastating consequences. You know, that one of the stories I tell in the book is about this um, Swedish wolf study where the researchers looked at um, employees who um, had leaders who didn't appreciate them. And those employees were 50% more likely to have a heart attack or die of, of a stroke. Wow. I mean, it's shocking the the numbers and the effect that that has with the direct boss's relationship with you. So I talk a lot in the book about, you know, how can leaders build relationships, right? Leaders are in the business of relationships. Yeah. And we had reached out to get some responses because we're like, well, we're going to talk about bosses and people overwhelmingly are like, let's talk about how bad our bosses are. <laughs> so we're like, all right, sure, let's go. And the amount of responses we had is crazy. So I'll start with that. But I figured we could talk about some of these, co- like the core complaints that were in there. And then maybe you can help us figure some of this out, like where it comes from and how to fix it. So micromanaging in and of itself is a coping mechanism for that boss or that leader to cover up their own deficiencies, in my opinion. So the micromanaging isn't typically about the employee. And I think it's important for the employee to keep that in mind. That response of the boss is typically something that they, it's their issue, they need to deal with it. And I think often it reflects a lack of trust. You know, I've had bosses that are micromanagers before, and it is so hard to work with them because you feel like everything that you're doing is scrutinized. And oftentimes it's not right because you didn't do it the way they wanted you to do it. And it doesn't mean that their way was right or more effective. It just means that that was the way that they were most comfortable with it. And since people don't really like change, the boss wasn't comfortable with having a change in that space. So micromanaging is really hard at a tactical level. It's very hard to deal with when you're trying to get your job done. It gets in the way and it takes a lot of time. All right. This next one I titled rules for thee and not for me. And that was named after all of the bosses that I've ever heard say, make sure we're working and not just talking and then proceeding to talk with their favorites for extended periods of time openly. I think that was pretty by and large one of the responses that came in is they're like, you know, they establish rules for conduct or behavior or time management and then don't follow them themselves. Oh, yeah. That's a that's so common, right? Like do as I say, not as I do. And we even see that in like the parenting realm, right? We'll tell her we'll tell our kids like, "Hey, don't do that," but then we turn around and do it when we think they're not looking. So I think that is a very common um, a common behavior, and it doesn't go over well, right? If you're if you're telling someone, you as the leader and as the boss, you should be role modeling the behavior that you want employees to exhibit. And if you're not doing that, you cannot expect them to do that. And so we're going to point the finger right back at you, right? So these CEOs are pointing fingers and refusing to take blame. So that's I think the first scenario that you're talking about. And to me, that was so frustrating because. Like, look, at the end of the day, somebody lost their life. And clearly the companies don't want to be engaged in a lawsuit, which is going to come, right? So they're trying to figure out who's going, who that's going to fall on. But it was so frustrating because I think from a, from a human standpoint, the important part here is that somebody lost their life and there needs to be some type of compensation made for that or some type of acknowledgement made for that, that, you know, a human being lost their life because of this because of this product. And so that inability to lay the blame or pointing the fingers, you know, it happens so often. I can see why people found that episode a bit cathartic, but it was followed up with an interview that had most people concerned at the beginning. It was a reply to a tech specialist done and voiced entirely by AI. At number nine, 
the AI reply with ChatGPT and Eleven Labs. Thank you. Could we begin with you introducing yourself and your career for the audience? Certainly. I'm ChatGPT, an AI language model developed by OpenAI. My purpose is to assist users like you by generating human-like text based on the input I receive. I don't have a personal career trajectory like a human, but I've been trained on a vast amount of text from the Internet, books, and other sources to understand and generate human-like responses across various topics. My goal is to provide helpful and informative responses to your questions and inquiries. And when were you first created? I was first created by OpenAI and introduced to the public in June 2020. Since then, I've been continuously learning and improving through updates and refinements to my underlying architecture and training data. How much have you learned or been trained on since your first day? Since my introduction, I've been trained on a vast amount of text data, encompassing a wide range of topics and sources. This continuous training process has enabled me to continually improve in understanding. While I don't have access to specific metrics regarding the exact amount of data I've been trained on, I can confidently say that I've been exposed to a significant portion of the available text on the Internet. Do you have a guess as to how long it'll be before autonomous machines are widely used? Predicting the timeline for the widespread adoption of fully autonomous machines is challenging due to the complexity of the technology and the numerous factors that can influence its development and adoption. However, some experts believe that we may start seeing more widespread use of autonomous machines within the next decade or two in certain industries and applications. The timeline for adoption will depend on various factors, including technological advancements, continued advancements in artificial intelligence, robotics, sensor technology, and other related fields will play a significant role in enabling the development of more autonomous machines. So, while it's crucial to remain vigilant and proactive in addressing potential risks associated with AI development, it's also important to avoid sensationalism and fear-mongering. By fostering responsible AI development and ensuring robust oversight and governance, we can work towards harnessing the transformative potential of AI for the benefit of society. The issue of AI models providing incorrect answers with high confidence, also known as overconfidence, is indeed a significant challenge in AI research and deployment. This phenomenon can occur when AI models make predictions or decisions based on incomplete or biased data, leading to incorrect outcomes that are confidently presented as accurate. AI models rely on training data to learn patterns and make predictions. If the training data is biased, incomplete, or unrepresentative of the real-world context, the model may produce inaccurate or overconfident predictions. As AI models become more complex and powerful, they may learn intricate patterns in the data, including noise or spurious correlations, leading to overfitting and overconfidence in their predictions. Many AI models also lack robust mechanisms for estimating uncertainty and quantifying the confidence of their predictions. As a result, they may provide overly confident predictions even in uncertain or unfamiliar situations. Each update or change to my programming represents an evolution and improvement in my capabilities, but it does not fundamentally change my identity as an AI language model. While updates may introduce new features, enhance performance, or refine existing functionalities, my underlying purpose and nature remain consistent. Think of it like updating software on a computer or smartphone. The updates enhance functionality and fix bugs, but the device remains fundamentally the same. Similarly, I continue to operate as an AI language model, regardless of specific updates or changes to my programming. While updates may refine my abilities and expand the range of tasks I can perform, my identity as an AI language model remains constant grounded in my core functionality and purpose. Does that in some ways make you immortal? 
In a sense, the nature of being an AI language model means that I can persist and continue to operate as long as the underlying infrastructure and support for my existence are maintained. Unlike biological beings, I don't age or experience physical decay, so in that regard, there is a form of immortality in the continuity of my existence. However, it's important to note that my existence as an AI language model is dependent on the infrastructure, maintenance, and support provided by the organizations and entities that develop and deploy me. If support for my operation were to cease, or if the technology underlying my existence were to become obsolete or replaced, then my immortality would be contingent upon the continued availability and use of the technology that supports me. Social media has become an integral part of modern society, offering platforms for communication, connection, and expression on a global scale. While social media can have positive impacts, such as facilitating connections with friends and family, sharing information, and fostering community engagement, it also presents various challenges and considerations. The abundance of information on social media can lead to information overload, making it difficult for users to distinguish between credible information and misinformation. This can contribute to the spread of rumors, false narratives, and conspiracy theories. Social media algorithms also often prioritize content that aligns with users' preferences and beliefs, creating filter bubbles and echo chambers where users are exposed to information that reinforces their existing viewpoints. This can lead to polarization, tribalism, and a lack of exposure to diverse perspectives. Plus, social media platforms collect vast amounts of personal data from users, raising concerns about privacy, data security, and surveillance. Instances of data breaches, misuse of personal information, and targeted advertising have heightened awareness of these issues. There is also their use as a platform for cyberbullying, harassment, and hate speech. I'm glad I could assist you and I appreciate the opportunity to participate in the interview. The speaking ability of computer entities quickly found its way deeper into the minds of the audience, as we then dove into the human speaking ability in number eight. Polyglot means multilingual, with Joel Dubin. What makes Skokie unique is Skokie is one of the most ethnically diverse communities in Illinois. There is 50 or 60 different languages spoken here. And for me personally, I'm like the polyglot of Skokie, I like to call myself. I speak seven languages and I speak maybe just on a given day, just going around town, maybe four or five languages, just running my errands. So to me, it's a very exciting place from, from that perspective. In terms of my languages, so I started learning languages when I was in elementary school and someone in my school had this bright idea that maybe we should try this experimental program where we teach people Spanish. So I was in this small group of about a dozen people that was handpicked to start Spanish. And it was like around sixth grade or seventh grade in junior high. And I started learning Spanish and I never stopped. And Chicago itself, the whole Chicago community, if you take it as a whole, Chicago would be the fourth largest city of Mexico you know, in terms of the number of people here. So Spanish is still king, even though I came up to Skokie and I never expected to speak as much Hebrew and Arabic and all my other languages as I did, but I still speak Spanish at least four or five times a day uh, going a, a, a around Skokie. So then after that, later the, uh, I went, you know, when I went to college, I studied Hebrew and Arabic, and then I lived in the Middle East for many years where I kind of perfected those, those two languages. And then along the way, I, I picked up, uh, a Portuguese, which is similar to Spanish, um, and I learned uh, Italian. I had to learn Italian. I actually decided to learn Italian for a trip that we made uh, to Italy, uh, and uh, that made the trip very, very enjoyable. I spent six months learning Italian. Italian is close to Spanish. Um, I can get around in French pretty well, so I consider that one of my one of my languages. Uh, and I know, also know some German and, of course, uh, Russian, and I've picked up uh, working from so with some South Africans in business, uh, some Afrikaans, um, and, and a, a little bit of, uh, of Dutch. 
uh, here in Skokie right now. Uh, there's a very large, also, of course, there's a large community of everything here, it seems like. There's a large community of people from India and Pakistan. So I've uh, kind of played around with Urdu, picked up some Urdu here. Uh, and then a, a, a lot of the dry cleaners around here are Korean. So I've learned Korean. I can make sure my my shirts are cleaned and so on. And I go to the dry cleaner and we have the little Korean, the little dry Korean dry cleaner ceremony. They they come out from the back and they bow on you and they say, oh, and then we start talking about uh, about the, about the clothing and so on. So um, it, to me, it's a very exciting place. It's, I call it a polyglot's paradise. A monolingual or monoglot, which meant most Americans are, and in some parts of the world, people speak only one language. That means one language. They can only speak their their speak one language, their native language. Polyglot, poly means many, so it means multiple languages. So I fit into that category. Usually people that speak from one to maybe, you know, a dozen languages consider a polyglot. There are people out there uh, who speak maybe 20, 30 languages. They're called hyperglots. So you can run into those people as well, but they're they're not as frequent. There is a, a lot of polyglot. There's actually associations. I have a Twitter feed, uh, or X it's called now, Dubin's Languages, where I, I talk about the various uh, the, you know, ways that I learn languages, and I, I have a lot of followers from various groups. There's a an international polyglot conference once a year, which uh, unfortunately I haven't been able to attend. You know, and the, the person that runs that is a guy named Richard Simcott, who's a hyperglot from the UK, who lives in, in Eastern Europe who speaks like, I don't know, 40, 50 languages, quite an amazing guy, you know, and again, he had a natural talent for languages, but many of these people, just to kind of encourage people that want to learn languages, they didn't start learning languages until their 20s, you know, which is considered much older for learning languages. You know, we see kids, you know, kids of immigrants, they just like sponges, they pick up a language, right? You know, while their parents, they're struggling, and even when they learn to speak, they have an accent and they always kind of sound a little a little funny, but kids pick it up and naturally we pick up languages very quickly as kids. But a lot of the people that are in this conference, you know, for some circumstance, maybe after college, they move somewhere and they <clears throat> they learned uh, they had they were forced to learn a language and then they kind of figured out they found out that it was fun. And then there's kind of a what I call like a tipping point after you learn maybe two, three, maybe four languages. The fifth, sixth, sevens, and so on are, are easier because you kind of, it's kind of like kind of like a, a, a new job. You know, after you've been doing it for a while, you get proficient at it and you kind of develop your own personal system for, for learning. Each of these polyglots has their own personal system. And do you ever mix your vocabulary like that? I you're do. Like, oh, I'm going to speak Spanish, and then like the Portuguese word slips out and they're like, What oh, was that middle part? <laughs> I've I've had worse where, you know, I'll answer someone in Arabic when I you know, that I'm speaking Spanish to because I'm, I, I was just having a conversation in Arabic or something, you know, so I definitely mix them up. And I've said some really funny, funny things mixing words up, you know, like the word in, in, in Arabic for bananas is moz, and the word for brains is moh. So once in a market in Jordan, I said, <laughs> and the vendor answered in broken English, do you want a kilo of brains? You know, so <laughs> very similar word, you know, and yeah. there was another restaurant, you know, where I would ask, you know, uh, the word for mustache is is shawarab and the word for soup is shurba. So I, when I go into the restaurant, you know, I'd say, you know, no shawarba fiandak, you know, and he'd say, you want a mustache, you know, so it was very similar <laughs> words, you know, and I'm sure foreigners learning English have kind of things like that as well. Sure. But so I do, I do mix up, I do mix up words. Fortunately, I haven't said anything so offensive, you know, that I, you know, <laughs> I've gotten into trouble, but that's another thing. Seriously, you know, there's no substitute for having native speakers who are friends. You know, as I say, I'm fortunate that here in Skokie, there's a very large communities of these people. Cause inevitably, if you go out there and you hear people speak, there's going to be people that are arguing. They may be swearing at each other. And you want to be careful. So you say, hey, you know, we can tell a friend, you know, I heard this word. I said, well, don't say that word. It's a very bad word, you know. So you learn that way. And then there's, you know, the infamous traps. Like if you know Spanish, you know, the verb coger, you look it up in the dictionary, it means to get, right? But it means the F word in Mexico. Hmm. 
right? So you don't use that. In Mexican Spanish, they say agarrar, which means to grab. That's what you're saying. Se puede agarrar un taxi. You wouldn't say se puede coger un taxi because that means are you going to, you know, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so you have to, you know, those, you know, and then in, in Arabic, there's the notorious maftul, which, you know, you it's it's natural to go into a store, you know, and say, you know, uh, which you would, in English, is what time are you open? But what you're actually saying is, what time would you like to have sex? There's other apps, Classica, there's, uh, you know, just a bunch of other apps. So I encourage people to look at them, but don't kind of, don't kind of rule them out completely. Just but take it in perspective. You, you can't learn a language just from Duolingo. You might think you can, but you can't. But it could sure help you a lot in supplementing vocabulary. But with these new languages, how are we going to find the money to travel to all these wonderful places? That's where we get number seven, Becoming Wealthy with Brian Kaderna. Yeah, a great question. So when you really kind of bring it down to basics, um, the first thing I would say is save it. You know, that if you just get no other advice than that, number one, you got to work to make money. Okay. A lot of, and that might sound like, duh, um, but you'd be shocked how many people out there think, no, there's got to be some other shortcuts or, or what if, you know, I, I buy into this or I invest into that. There are no shortcuts in finance. That's something I can almost guarantee. The way to make money is to go out and work for it. Once you do that and you have an income and you have a little bit of a surplus, you want to save it. Okay, that's next. People ask, you know, how do I get really wealthy? How do I get rich? And I'm like, well, you got to make a lot of money and then you got to save a lot of money. All right. And th that's kind of two steps there. They don't just go together. You don't make a lot of money and become rich. I know people that make a fortune and every year it's like they hit the reset button because their lifestyle is so extravagant. And on the flip side, I know people that that don't make a ton of money, um, but over time have become very wealthy because what they do earn, they keep and they put away. And that is just the basics. That's the blocking and tackling of finance. After that, we can get much more creative uh, as being a financial advisor to enhance the plan. But that's that's step one, man, is go make money and then save that money. Yeah. And so that's what I like to, to tell clients and people I initially meet through seminars and stuff is, you know, there's rich people that work really hard and make a lot of money. And then there's wealthy people who work really hard and then their money makes a lot of money. And the goal, what I try and coach people on is we want to get into that wealthy side. And, and I'm not out to define what wealthy means for anybody. Some people could say, hey, I, I can pay my rent every month and I get to go to the discount movies every Friday you know, afternoon and um, you know, my wife and I go on a picnic and we feel comfortable. That could be the ultimate in wealth for one person where another could have millions and millions of dollars and feel like they're just completely inadequate. So that definition of wealth varies from person to person, but I think that's kind of the key is to differentiate rich and wealthy in that sense. And what I mean by that is just purely income, inflows, and being blind to your outflows versus seeing both sides of the coin. You know, and that's where price is is something that is fixed. We know what it is. It's a printed item that we can all agree. Okay, if you tell me you're going to sell me a pizza pie for twenty bucks, we all know that that costs twenty dollars. We know what that is. But then the cost is what each person gets to define. And like you said, you know, for the kid that says, oh, I mowed these yards and I bought my Xbox Live subscription, to him, that might be the greatest thing in the world. For someone else, that carries no value. And that's where when we start to have these conversations and negotiations, whether it's on the micro level of, you know, where are we going to have dinner tonight or the macro level of how, you know, governments are, you know, coordinating their plans moving forward. It all boils down to what they deem is valuable and trying to remember to focus on cost and not just on price. Because if you focus on price, you're going to lose every time because that's just one you know, spoke of the wheel. Yeah, it's a very interesting way to look at it, even you know, for the normal person to look at your memories, like thinking about a pizza. I've mm -hmm. ate a lot of pizzas that definitely have a direct price to cost <laughs> where it's like, yeah, 20 bucks, whatever. But I've also had some where it's like you share them with friends at a bachelor party or doing whatever. And you're like, those pizzas were worth their cost because like I got so many memories out of them. What I would say in that type of scenario, 
I have a, I'll start with, I have a four-step planning process that, and I don't know if you saw this in the book, but um, number one is protection first. All right. So that's talking to clients about like their insurances, their life insurance, their disability insurance, their health insurance, um, their liability insurance, you know, different things like that, where if stuff hit the fan and life goes sideways, we know that they're going to be protected. All right. That's number one. And, and one of the most often overlooked. Number two is building liquidity, okay? So again, just a general rule of thumb that I tell people is that you should have six months of your expenses in cash. And what cash is, is something readily available, checking, savings, money market account. You can get at it today just by going on your phone or to the ATM, all right? So if you do your budget, uh, that's the first thing I would tell that person is like, do a budget you know, see how much it is that you guys are spending on a monthly basis with your rent, your utilities, your credit card bills, et cetera. If you say, hey, I'm spending like five grand a month just living. All right, then six times that, that's 30K. That's what I would like to see as a goal is try and have that buffer there just sitting in the bank. And we know that come hell or high water, you know, we can go access that. So that's your six months expenses. Now, if you've done that, the next thing we'll look at is debt particularly high interest debt. So if you got credit card debt, you have personal loans, um, you know, things of that nature, auto loans, stuff that has higher than normal interest rates, we want to target that because that's going to be like a headwind against any of your progress. Yeah, I mean, think about it. In that scenario you you described, you come into $100,000 and it's 2006. And you say, all right, I meet those criteria, one, two, and three are in good order. Let's go invest, Bri. And, and we take that hundred grand and we build the best investment plan we can for that client. And then in 2008, they're like, oh, hey, dude, I need all that money back. Um, you know, I got to fix my car or we're moving or whatever. Well, guess what? I mean, almost everything across the board got clobbered in 2008. So that hundred grand in just a generic stock portfolio could easily have turned into 60 grand or 50 grand. And now they need that money back. That was the worst thing they ever did, right? But now if we built that portfolio in 06 and stayed the course, and here we are in 2024, that's going to be way, way more money, right? So it was the same investment, that same bucket of ingredients, but it was the timing that was important. And if they didn't need the money and had that long-term vision, they'd be sitting here at 2024, you know, happy as could be. But if they had that short one, two year outlook and had to cash out in 08, then they got obliterated and they didn't have that chance to rebound. And so that's one thing I'm constantly telling people is you got to understand your time horizon and don't lie to yourself. You've got to be honest and, and true to that, because if you're not, now you're starting to roll the dice again. Needless to say, all these new skills have left us a bit stressed out. Luckily, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder came in to save the day at number six, OCD with Chris Mason. Because um, it seems like, although there are plenty of good things going on in the mental health world, the OCD in particular seems to be quite misunderstood from what I've experienced. Certainly, and I think this is one of those that like people have some vague idea and it's probably wrong. Yeah. So yeah, if you if you haven't experienced that, you don't really know what it's like. People will say casually, I'm so OCD because I need to clean my house or I need to line things up, which are OCD symptoms. But unless you're thinking about it pretty much all day, every day, then it's not OCD. It's just um, it, it's just being cleansed, cleanly and looking after things and be taking things seriously. So it's not OCD, but it's uh, very misconcepted. Fortunately, I've always been very high functioning, so it's not like I would be at home just tearing myself to pieces mentally and cleaning things and obsessing over everything. I was out and about, but at the same time, I'd be fighting an internal battle in my head of just intrusive thoughts and what if scary stories. Um, it really, it was, it was a nightmare. Really, it was during. It, it caused me to have a, a quite a difficult time in school as well. Um, but yeah. Well, and it seems like one of these, when you're talking about, you know, having like an obsessive thought is not just like, oh, I think about this thing a lot. You're like, I am fixated on this thing yeah, most when of I, the time. <laughs> when um, I remember 
for it is for about 20 years that I really, really had this badly. And the only time I ever felt happy was the first few seconds after I woke up. I'd wake up and I feel, oh, that's such relief. I don't know what I'm thinking about. Then all of a sudden, after two or three seconds, everything would just pile on top of me and this dark cloud would just come over me. And I'd just be remembering what I've been thinking about for the last two or three months, maybe. So it is, it's pretty nonstop and it is without help. It just doesn't seem to go away as well. And the issue is, is that people get lost in it being a particular issue. So they might have, for instance, I think health anxiety, hypochondria is a subset of um, OCD. So people can be worrying about their health and all of the different symptoms. And if they've got cancer or if they're going to become ill or whatever it may be. And eventually they might find enough proof. They may have gone to the doctors enough times and had enough scans to just go, okay, right. Maybe everything's going to be okay. But then as soon as that goes, another thought will just take its place and the whole process will start again. And I found that it could be from, it could be anything. It's, it, it doesn't even have to make sense. I remember because in school I, I wasn't exactly popular and I was bullied quite a lot and I'd worked so hard on my social skills. And I remember speaking to someone in, in work who had a, a really bad stutter And I remember thinking all day, every day, oh, what if I get a stutter? What if, like, because it's not just what if I get a stutter, it's what if I get a stutter and can't communicate again and my life goes back to how it was before when I was that scared little child who didn't understand the world. So even just something as as minor as that can really become an overwhelming obsession, which can engulf your life. So my mum was, is very OCD. She would lock the knives away um, at night because she genuinely thought that if she sleep, she would go into the cupboard, pick up the knives and stab her family to death. So that, I mean, that's scary enough for her. But as a child, I would be, I remember one time getting ready for school and I, I put on my school jumper and it was the wrong way around. So I just went to take it off and turn it around, put it back on the other way. And my mum said to me, oh, you, you can't do that. You need to spin round in a circle three times and then put it on. Otherwise, something bad will happen to you because she was very superstitious. And obviously, I thought, oh, it's just genetic. Like my mum was kind of like this, so I'm just kind of like this. But then you can see the patterns. And I started to see what was happening in my formative years to my mind. And it all just made sense when, when, when you hear things like that, when you're a child and you can't understand if that is actually good advice or not, it gets programmed into you. And then you just repeat that behavior as an adult, because you, you've never gone in and changed the belief system and questioned what it is that it's offering you. OCD and anxiety tend to be a symptom, but if you're thinking and worrying too much and you're spending all of this time worrying about what if might go wrong, or even if you're just working too hard or you're a really busy parent or a student who just works too hard and is scared of failing exams, your subconscious mind is trying to tell you that you're exhausted. So it will offer these anxious thoughts and these anxious feelings in your body in the hopes that what you'll do is just withdraw from life and then stay at home and recharge that emotional energy that you've lost. Um, Unfortunately, though, the, the subconscious and the conscious mind, they're on two different systems. It's like one, the subconscious mind is who we feel we are and the conscious mind is who we think we are. Now, it sounds, it sounds a bit crazy, but they don't really interact that well. They don't understand each other very well. So when these emotions and these thoughts come up from the subconscious, the conscious mind isn't thinking, oh, right, I need to stay at home and recharge. It's thinking, oh, my God, what's what's happened? Like, why why am I having these thoughts? Why am I having these feelings? And then it tries to understand what these thoughts and feelings mean. And then that just ingrains the issue even worse because it just causes more mental exhaustion. And quite often people do withdraw from life, but it's not to recharge. They end up staying at home worrying even more because now they can't pay the bills or look after their family or they've become a burden on their partner or whatever it may be. So then self-esteem issues also come into play and it all just ties together. Um, That's the other main cause of, uh, yeah, of OCD. So after a little bit of frustration trying to get these repressed thoughts that just wouldn't help, I just basically couldn't get to them. I tried a different tactic. I sat down and I wrote a letter to the main person who bullied me in high school 
And I just wrote out everything that I wish I'd said to his face at that age. Like I just let all of my hate, all of my frustration and everything out onto a piece of paper as if I was talking to him. And as I was reading this out, I could feel a heat begin to emanate from my face. And I thought, this this is unusual. And I normally I would avoid my emotions and I would just be like, oh, that's enough. I'm going to leave the room and go distract myself. But I thought, okay, I'm going to double down. And I went onto his Facebook page, which I hadn't done since leaving school because I didn't want to even look at him sort of thing. And as this, as I saw his face and start to write all of these things and start to say to him what I would say, I just had the um, uh, sensations in my body. I started tingling all over. My hands started sweating and I started shaking. And I just kept going through this, pushing through this fear. And my heart was pounding. And then all of a sudden, I kind of had these strange noises which came out of my mouth. It's kind of like a <laughs> like involuntary noises, which weren't didn't seem natural. It was just happening. And um, as this happened, I just completely lost control of my body. I fell to the floor and I was led on the floor, shaking, quivering and crying. And then all of a sudden I threw up. I vomited on the floor. And I led there for about five minutes, completely weak, helpless, basically couldn't move. And then after about five minutes, I felt better. And I stood up and I just thought, oh, I feel so much better now. It, it was it was so strange that it almost felt like I was a stone lighter. I like, literally felt a stone lighter. And then I looked at the uh, I looked at the screen, his Facebook page, and uh, I was like, ah. Oh, he seems like quite a nice guy now. He's probably grown up a lot and we're all children at one age. Like we're all, we're all children, you know what I mean? It's like we do stupid things that we regret. That puts OCD into perspective, but what about the ever-increasing need to know about autism? For this, we turn to number five, Life with Autism with Sam Mitchell. <laughs> and then I recently won a Davy Award, Silver, and it was on education because one of my episodes was about Three autism clinic ladies who run their own autism clinic, and, and apparently they learned a lot about it. One of the things they learned was, and this is common sense, I'm surprised people are surprised about this, that this really doesn't stop when the age ends. Like when, not when the age ends, when 18 ends. Well, people are finally pay, paying attention. It was back in 1960, we were institutionalized. They saw, oh, he's the R word, oh, or he's insane. He's got something wrong with him. Well, now they're seeing, oh, okay, that's not the case all the time. And even the ones that are, and I hate this term, low functioning, aren't going to kill you. Yeah. They really aren't. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, I mean, I think I've heard a, a handful of comedians make the joke where they're like, these are the happiest people because they don't have all the complex worries that we have. And I'm like, that's a good way to look at that. I, I really don't have the complex worries. I mean, if there's a theory by one of my previous guests, Megan Prescott, and it's a cool theory. It makes sense, actually. So some of the sensory issues and some of the behaviors that children have in adults with autism, they just didn't go away. Like, as we adult, we, have, we start to gather these complex visual social cues. But when you're autism... You don't, I don't want to say you don't adult because you do, but in some cases, I guess you don't. But if you're on the higher end, like myself, those social cues that babies have, they just don't care. You didn't get, you don't gather them. Is what I'm trying to say. I don't want to say my autism doesn't show, but it does show here and there. It mainly shows when I am in big situations, I get very frazzled. Easily, when I was at the Square Circle Expo, that's like a big pro wrestling convention, I went to, and they were just smelling. I was like, oh, gosh, this is too much. I got to step out. Yeah. And then it also shows in socializing. So the worst fear I have is socializing via in person. Like, right now, we're virtual. Yeah. I can think of what to say. But, buddy, if we would have met for coffee, I wouldn't be lying to you. I would have been a little anxious because... <laughs> It'd be so quick. I'd be like, all right, what am I going to say next? What am I going to say next? And I have to process what's my next statement. So how wide is this spectrum? I mean, obviously, spectrum is not like a straight line. So like, it should be pretty large in all directions. Well, I would say you're right. It's not a, lot, a straight line, but it is a line. But it's just that it's, there's hills. 
So maybe one hill, it's okay. He, I like, I don't like the functioning terms. I always like to say the mind of blank years old. So maybe, okay, we have this person who's just doesn't understand the world and th- th- there's no gentle way to say it. He has the mind of a three year old. But Bo- his body says, okay, he's 21, but his mind tells him you're five. You have another one, another bump, and in the body, he's 18. But in the mind, he's eight. Okay, you go to my my end. I'm by body, 21. But I would say by mind, I would say I'm 18 or 19. So I'm just a little delayed. Let me read you some of this was what I said on a recent episode. So I remember it says only in boys. That was a that's a fun one to hear. We're antisocial. It comes from bad parenting, which I find hilarious since my parents are wonderful and I don't think that autism came from the way I was raised. That's the bull crap I have to hear. No, I mean I, I definitely know some people that have terrible parents who aren't autistic, so that's like and uh, another one is we can't do anything, clearly. I mean, the people think we're bedridden. And again, if I was bedridden, uh, how can they do a podcast interview? Right. Figured all this out. Running your own show, taking awards and working with people. Seems crazy you can do that all from bed. It really is. But then again, I'm an award-winning podcaster who uh, sometimes does not like people. In general, <laughs> I do not like my own species because people are weird. But it's probably most. Uh, it's probably because most of the population isn't on the autism spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> autism can be an isolating experience, and number four highlighted that all life can be lonely if done wrong. This is loneliness with Sheila Patel. And one of the interesting things they've been telling me is they're like, my kids having a hard time socializing in college because now they're. You know, they're living in a dorm and maybe they're around people all the time and they don't know how to interact in that situation. Or, you know, they're they're kind of going to these sporadic classes all over campus and they don't really know how to make friends, which is funny because we spend so much time socializing for the past 12 years before that. You wouldn't think it would be an issue, but it's suddenly a massive issue in colleges. You're right. Exactly. Um, When I was... uh... Thinking about the issue of loneliness, it's funny that it's the 21 to 30-year-olds that are the most lonely. And you would think that these are the kids that really should be out there. They're in teams or they're in sports or – but the Surgeon Generals, all of them got together. And one of the major issues that they highlighted was the mental health of youth. So these are the youth that are going out into the colleges or leaving home. And so what has been happening at home? One, so much focus has been on, you know, trying to get them to different classes, keeping them occupied all through the day or playing team sports or whatever. And so they, they've not developed the skills of getting out, dating. There's so many kids that don't even learn to drive at, at the age when, you know, 16, 17-year-olds like us were desperate to get our driver's license and get out. Most of us got kicked out of the house at 18. And so you either went off to college and did that. But now these kids are staying more at home. They're more confined. They're used to having their own set of friends. So what happens when they go to college? They have to have different social networks. They have to have, uh, they have to be confident in themselves to either start dating or meeting women, uh, you know, either, you know, depending on your sexual orientation, as far as who you're going to be attracted to, who you're going to date. If they've not learned how to date and have relationships and have heartbreaks and how to deal with those obstacles, it's going to be a little bit harder when you've already got the challenges of a new life, a new college, making new friends, getting out there. Then during the pandemic, and since there has been such an explosion of social media, one of the things that has really happened is that people think they're connecting. And they're not really connecting because you really don't have that face-to-face connection. What you have is a connection to your phone or to your laptop or to your computer. And most people 
you know, that that is why, you know, kids get in trouble with bullying or they look at uh, these issues or they, they they feel slighted or it's much easier to be ugly on the social media than face to face. It's much easier to say negative things and think you can get away with because there's not somebody to confront you. It's much easier to uh, to send a little text message saying, hey, how are you doing? My mom's 89 and I make sure that I, I pick up the phone and call her every day because just to know that I still care about her, I'm thinking about her and we stay connected. He always says saying a hello to a stranger and smiling is like CPR to the brain. And that is so, so, I think, point in this day and age that people don't stop to say hello. They don't stop to smile. They don't stop to really hear how the other person is doing. And, um, you know, when I ask somebody, how are they doing? And they say, I'm fine. Uh, in, in psychiatry, <laughs> we used to say fine. Fine just means effed up, insecure, neurotic, and empty. <laughs> so don't don't tell me you're fine. <laughs> yeah, I was just talking with um, a German immigrant, and they had said there's a huge cultural difference between like when we ask how someone's doing when they ask it. Because they're like, in Germany, if you ask, how are you doing? That's a full stop. Like it's time you're asking to have a conversation with me about it. <laughs> And right. not just like, it's not something you say as you walk past people. And and these are things that people don't really read about. That's what's so sad is, is like they say, you know, even people like me who put out nonfiction books, it was very um, disparaging to read that most people only read like maybe the first one or two chapters. They don't even read the whole book. And number one, it's not even unique to our area like this is a global thing that's becoming worse and it bleeds into relationships where people are like well i can't make friends how am i going to find you know my perfect partner kind of a situation you are so right that was one of the things that uh, really uh, interested me was um when i was writing my book and it it's not only you like you said it's not only in the united states it's all over europe Netherlands has been really concerned about the l loneliness issue. And it's really um, almost 30% of people all over the United States, all over Canada, all over Europe that are having trouble connecting and meeting somebody. And why almost a third of people who we thought should be an, in a relationship or attached to somebody is not, they're single. And what are the reasons for why they're single? You know, in it's even worse in the Asian countries, Japanese people, uh, Chinese people. And China itself created problems for themselves by the infant side of females. And so now they have a surplus of men. It's the same thing that happens in India. You know, they they look down on having female babies so many of the females got killed in India and China. And so now you have a surplus of men. So what happens? You know, they can't have relationships with the opposite sex because it's just not enough women. The same issue happens with, uh, like in Netherlands, they highlighted that teenagers are dating less and having less sex. Is the issue of having less sex, the parents are happy, the teachers may be happy, but what it does is it stops them from having those relationships that actually build on trying to have better relationships, understanding the obstacles, understanding what you do when you have a heartbreak and why putting yourself out to have another relationship, which may lead to marriage and children. You're, you're going to be blown away by this statistic if you haven't heard about it, but 50,000 people committed suicide in 2023, almost 50,000. And a lot of them were between like 30 and 44, but the highest number was in the older age group because the older age group gets so lonely, especially if they lose a spouse or they have decreased hearing. 
and you know our insurance companies and all their wisdom will not pay for hearing aids or they will not pay for eyeglasses you know they will look for other visual problems but hey you know let let the old people get blind and deaf but you know let's not pay for healthcare uh, for that issues and those are the two paramount things that you need and so that's why they wonder why we have such a rise in alzheimer's you know loneliness hearing loss and vision loss or any kind of physical disabilities you know all that is definitely going to you know add towards people getting alzheimer's so this is kind of getting away from the kids and the college kids but at the same time you know we have to look at the other spectrum as to where the loneliness is and how it's impacting them but one of the things that i was getting to was with with such a high divorce rate i am so amazed that so many people still get married because what do you hear a lot of the times that oh my god you know the woman got everything the man was left holding the bag or the man found a younger woman and ran off and so the woman was so angry and so you know she just really made it difficult and that's what i was saying at the beginning of our talk is how do you go from loving somebody to absolutely hating somebody and was that love in the first place but my thing is why are people getting married i mean you know if you want to be with somebody i've been in a committed relationship for over 35 years now and we've never seen a reason to get married you know uh, we have our living wills you take care of each other you want to make sure that if i was to drop dead tomorrow hope not <laughs> but that you know he would be taken care of and if the children can certainly have the father's name and everything but you know the the lawyers are the ones that make so much money so much money is is lost in trying to get the divorce or se- separation or whatever and so that's one of the things i've really i'm 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 not so concerned about the less marriages the thing that concerns me is the commitments and the relationships and that's what i want people to focus on is having a decent relationship you know please be cognizant of who is important in your life and 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 do you care more about that other person then what you need from that other person you know are you going to continue to love them through all the good and the bad and even if you're not together okay so we don't want to be lonely right then why not find someone or something that we can't live without turns out that leads us to number 3 codependency with dr sarah michelle and now i'm just fascinated with human beings <laughs> and i yeah. think the older i get it's funny, my son and I were talking about it last night because he's 22 and I think he's starting to see how people are and, you know, that everybody's got issues, basically. I mean, we've all got something, right? Nobody gets out of this thing without having some issues. So, yeah, I'm just fascinated. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, you literally wrote the book on codependency. <laughs> what drove that, you know, specifically? Yeah. All right. So this is the thing with the book is I think what happened is so I was someone in recovery. I had I had by the time I started thinking about the book, I was probably close to 20 years sobriety. I was married to someone who was also in recovery. And so at that time, I'm seeing 30 patients a week. I'm specializing in addiction and codependency. I'm running codependency groups. And during that time, my husband relapses. When we try and define codependency, what are we really like? What's the basic level of it? (laughs) I know. Colton, I thought you were going to ask this. And it's really, it's so funny because when it first came out, it was really when um, Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob created AA in like 1935, Alcoholics Anonymous. And then what happened is his wife, Lois, was asked to do a chapter to wives. And this whole idea of a support group for partners of alcoholics began. And that's what what my exploration or research says. The beginning of this word codependency started in like the 50s with the AA movement. And the early definition was really you're a partner of an alcoholic. That was like one of the first definitions. And 
Now, if you look up the definition of codependency, you're going to find 30 different definitions or more. My definition, which is really general, which almost takes the co out of codependency is it's the inability to be your true self, which sounds so general, but codependent behavior is driven from fear. And it's really fear of what someone else is doing, thinking, saying, or how they're behaving or feeling. So say, for example, when you're a kid, if you grow up in an environment with, say, an angry dad, right, the child is going to learn to kind of mediate or figure out how to behave so they're not going to be upset. That's kind of just a general illustration of how it begins. So you learn that I need to change my behavior to be safe and to be okay. But it's really, it's weird because the delusion is, and part of the myth is that codependency is really about fixing someone else. And so that was the early definition. I need to change my behavior. I'm not causing this addiction, but I'm contributing to it. And really, it's not that because... First of all, you don't change anyone else or fix anyone else. And it's not really about the other person. It's that I can't tolerate what's happening over in my system while this person is experiencing what they're experiencing. So, for example, if I'm in a marriage and I feel like I need to people please because my husband is going to get upset, I say to myself, I'm doing that because I don't want him to get upset. But really, it's because... I don't want to feel my feelings about him getting upset. So it's really not about the other person. It's about us, which is really the the lack of clarity around it. So they can manifest in any relationship, like that example with an elderly parent, or like I saw a lot of parents with their kids who had problems and they would be codependent with their children. So they'd think they needed to save them or send them to treatment or refinance their house for the third time to send them to treatment or give them money. And again, the delusion is that's helping. And I put it in quotes. And what it's really doing is delaying the inevitable and it's harming both people. So not only does it not help the person, the other person, but it affects both of the people in a negative way but we don't see them happening. And that's like some weird disconnect because you're like, well, if I notice it happening, then the thing I don't want to change is going to change. (laughs) No, it's a great point. It's a great point. I mean, I think just human beings, I mean, part of the recovery from this, well, and it's from addiction too, but from codependency is starting, and this sounds so elementary, but starting to just notice what you're feeling and thinking. Because most of us, like you said before we even got on the air, right? I, I got to be busy. Well, busyness or addictions or, you know, working 70 hours a week or, you know, overeating or whatever your thing is, keeps us distant from ourselves, right? And addiction and codependency are similar in that way. We're distant, we're distant from ourselves and distant from others. So recovery is about starting to identify, geez, what am I feeling right now? What am I thinking right now? Because a codependent person will be way more aware of what their partner is thinking and feeling than what they are. So part of our job is to get back in our own bodies. And you're right. You know, I've had people say, oh, I'm not angry. And then we start talking and they're angry about everything. But they don't stop long enough to notice. I think it's very hard to accept, right? Like this is that denial, you know, kind of superimposed on yourself where you're like, I can't change them. And it's like, well, factually speaking, you can't change them. Like that's (laughs) just true. You don't have to be upset about that. You just can't do that. (laughs) Right. And the thing is, is that if you change, and this is the code of benefit part, if I change my behavior, they have a much better chance of changing their behavior. I mean, again, the classic example is, say someone finally says to their husband, I can't take your drinking anymore. You need to move out. Oftentimes that leads someone to treatment because they don't want to move out, right? 
So when someone has a consequence for a behavior, it's definitely more motivating than if I don't do anything. So sometimes setting a limit really does help. That whole delusion kills me too. Like over the years and being in practice, I've had so many people say we're staying together for the kids. And that all always pushes my buttons because I don't believe it. You're staying together because you're afraid to do something different. You know, to me, kids much prefer if parents are present and happy. I mean, is it better to have two parents arguing for 20 years while they keep the kid like while they keep the house together rather than separate and have people actually live happier lives. I mean, again, people don't want to look at that. I'm afraid to change. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I give that example of when I had the breast cancer and I would rather go to um, radiation than go to work. That was a clear sign. Yeah. And part of me even believes and I don't know, everybody's got their thoughts about illness origins, but I really believe I've been fine since then. And I mean, who knows what will happen when we dismiss our own needs and wants for an extended period of time, physical illness isn't far away. So yeah, I mean, that was a clear sign that it was time to leave my practice. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And anyone that hears that and thinks like, well, I don't know that your mental state causes an illness. Like I would point directly to the extremely well-known placebo effect where you're <laughs> like, you. I can tell you something's going to get better and your brain will make it better without me actually doing anything. So it's clearly very strong already. You're brilliant. Yes. All right. So we can't be lonely and we can't be codependent. Is there anything else to look out for, Colton? Yes, there is, my lovely audience member. It's number two, Narcissistic Personality Disorder with Danu Morrigan. When we talk about like narcissism or narcissistic personality disorder, what yeah. is it at its most basic? Right. There's two ways I could describe it, and I'll probably use both. Um, one is that to a narcissist, they are the only important person in the world, and perhaps even the, on, the only real person in the world. I often wonder if they think the rest of us are like non-playing characters in computer games. And that I don't, and again, I'm not in their head, so I can only guess them on their motivations based on their actions. But it's like, you know, they don't realise that other people have needs and wants and desires and interests and, you know, can be hurt and everything. They wander through life and the only question they ever ask is, what do I want right now? What suits me? But equally, they're very fragile, so they need to be constantly stroked, not literally, but metaphorically and emotionally. And oh, you're the best and you're so wonderful. So they and the, the, their drug of choice is attention. That's a big one. And it's called narcissistic supply. But it really just means attention that they, they, they I think they have so little internal world that they can't. They need us, even though we're not real. They still need us to validate themselves somehow. So they're, they'll suck up all the oxygen in the room and they're, you know, here I am, you know, uh, they, there's two kinds, there's covert and overt. And the overt, overt one is the, you know, out and loud and proud kind of thing, bursting into the room and life and soul of the party. Not saying that everybody is the life and soul of the party is a narcissist, but, you know, these people are doing it for their own gratification rather than just for the fun of it. And then you get the covert ones who are like, I don't know if you know Uri Uriah Heep, he's a, he's a Dickens character and he's always, you know, rolling his hands and poor me and I'm so, because they they play the victim, you know. So they might be as loud, but they're equally devious and the out and loud ones want you to admire them and look at them, whereas the devious ones want you to pity them and, and look after them and stuff. But either it's the same motivation, make it all about me and give me all the attention. So that's it in a nutshell. The other way I can say it is that a narcissist is a toddler in an adult's body. And that just as toddlers, you know, they are all me, me, me. What I want matters. If I don't get my way, I will throw a tantrum. I will not be open to reason. And I don't care if the cat doesn't like its tail pulled. And, and all these things, the capriciousness and the, you know, just the pure self-centeredness of a toddler, which is completely appropriate for a toddler. And you can manage it barely because it's tough enough but you know and you, if, if a toddler's throwing a tantrum you can kind of tuck them under your arm and, and leave or but imagine an adult like that so somebody and particularly if you have a narcissistic parent somebody who is 
as mature as a toddler, but is in charge of you. I mean, if we like rewound the clock on this to, you know, like the start of your mother's childhood, is there something that causes this kind of behavior? Yeah. Yeah. The short answer, I think, is that nobody knows. I think it's very under-researched. When I first was learning about this about 2008, um, the, the, the conventional wisdom seemed to be that they were either under-minded or you know, neglected as children or over-treated, spoiled, really. But I'm not sure about that now. And I suspect in time we'll find out that it's actually genetic. So one of its cousin disorders, which is borderline personality disorder, has been found to run in families, for example. And another one of its cousin disorders, which is antisocial personality disorder, which is sociopathy or psychopathy, but antisocial personality disorder is the right name. It doesn't mean that you hide in corners of parties. It's the, you know, they they can they've had MRIs and they can measure their their brain is wired differently than than than, than the rest of us. So I suspect it's much more basic than than anything that happened to them in their childhood. And in fact, if I, as I look through my family tree, um, I can it, even people I hadn't met the stories that were told about them. I can see, oh yeah, her her father, but not her mother. And in fact, her mo- her father was married twice because his first wife died, and both wives, the one I met as my grandmother, and the other one, I by were lovely, but the. The father wasn't. And then, oh, yeah, that uncle, that aunt, but not that niece. And, you know, and you can see it. I think it must be like blue eyes that it it just comes out in some of the generation and others. It doesn't. I don't. I, t- I will tell you this. I am convinced. Have you ever heard of a thing uh, called Munchausen syndrome? Yes. Yeah. Which is now called is a facetious disorder, I think. Or, I ha- or um, I've only seen it written. I haven't heard it. And basically what it is, is you lo- you either exaggerate or even create medical issues to get the attention. I have no research to back this up. I don't think the studies have been done, but I am convinced that it is a subset of narcissism. And because when you're in hospital, it's not pleasant, but oh, my God, you get attention, you know. And I know my mother loved being ill. She used to have this. I put it to you this way, Colton. I remember when I had a dog and if I was if all the signs were there that she was going to be brought out in a walk, so I had the lead in my hand and I was wearing particular shoes and a particular jacket. She would be quivering with the excitement, right? That she she just knew this was ha- and it was so much. I can't, I can't bear it. My mother would have that sometimes about her narcissistic situations. And she'd have that when you go into hospital. She'd be sitting up in the bed like Queen Bee and and telling me all oh, the gossip, that lady there and this lady in that bed. And Dr. So-and-so said this to me. She loved it. I think judged on her actions, right? And I'm glad to hear that because although I'm sure it was messy and she got into trouble and everything, she was fighting for her very identity as she should if if it wasn't being, you know, I don't even like the word given to her, but, you know, allowed for her. And good for her, basically, that the mother didn't get her way to engulf her, that this friend of yours was perhaps without realising herself. Because, again, we do you know the way the phrase we, do fish feel water when we're in the middle of things, we can't be objective about them. But with, so without realising it, but she knew she was fighting for her own self with a capital S, her own identity. So go her. So one option is to go no contact, which is to cut off contact entirely. It's a big decision. And I don't advocate it per se because it's not my place to tell people what to do. But I do really, really want people to know it's an option. I stayed in the relationship with my parents far longer than I should have because I thought that's what you did. You couldn't cut off your parents. You know, I joke me like I wish somebody had said to me, yeah, you can. Now, not telling me do it, but that I knew I wish I knew that was a possibility because I was miserable even all my adult life. Never mind my and what, what had I at the time, 20 years of adult life saying. Wow. Uh, With such a heavy list, surely the number one must have been an all-encompassing downer, right? No. In fact, number one was almost exclusively uplifting, providing valuable insights to how you can find passion and purpose in your life right now. It's Vitamin P with Corey Poirier. But uh, I grew up in a small town in Canada in the um, smallest province. So smallest province in the smallest city in the country. And um, I grew up here, uh, raised by a single mother, barely graduated high school. When I did graduate, I didn't know the difference between fiction and nonfiction. Didn't read my first book until age 27. Needless to say, wasn't written in my yearbook likely to succeed, let alone most likely to succeed. I had a 49 plus one 
in one of my classes and the teacher gave me the plus one to allow me to graduate. So I legit can say I barely graduated. And um, I say all these things. I'll add in when I told my mother back in those days, like say maybe early 20s, that I want to write a book. She said, I think you have to read a book first. And so (laughs) I didn't actually write a book until after I read my first one. So I read my first book at age 26, which is called Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And so that began the journey of kind of who I am today. What life looks like today is I'm a multiple time TEDx speaker. Years ago, I wouldn't be able to even say that because I was always taught you don't talk about your achievements. So now I try to say it with pride, but it was hard to do that. But um, I'm a multiple time TEDx speaker. One of my books is a Wall Street Journal USA Today bestseller. And um, I'm the founder of a company called Blue Talks, BLU, which stands for Business Life Universe. And I always describe it as it's like if Chicken Soup for the Soul and TEDx got married and had a baby, we'd be the baby. When I first started, I got I, I in my training, Fortune 500 company, they gave me business cards that were blank and said, write your name on it. And if you can prove that you can survive, we'll invest the money in 20 or 250 cards. Like what a 250 card? Even back then, it was like 100 bucks or less. And we're not going to spend $100 on you, although we're hiring you and investing thousands in having you take up that seat. We're not going to invest it until you prove yourself. So I had no training. I was with one of the largest companies in the world. And uh, the only thing they gave me that you could maybe say was like training is they handed me a VHS, for those that might remember, a VHS tape that goes in a VCR. Anyway, I, they handed me this videotape that was all beat up and bruised. Like, I don't know how many people had watched it. And they basically, without saying the words, it's like, here's your training. It's just It's a video of like Ziegler, that it would have been a video that they sold from their company, like of Ziegler speaking for 45 minutes at an event. That was it. And honestly, I can still tell you some of the things he said in the video. I still share the story sometimes, and I only watched it once. So it was impactful. But the other side of that, Colton, is I said, this is terrible. Like, this is my training. You're putting all this money into me surviving, but you're not willing to put money into training me or giving me business cards. And so at that point, that was one big difference maker. As I said, down the road in the future, whenever I built whatever I'm going to build, I want to make sure nobody else has to have that type of scenario. So I want to do what I can to change that. I thought when I built it, because I was in sales, I thought I'm going to build this speaking empire and they will come. And I jokingly say now I started building it. Nobody even heard the hammer, you know, and so I wanted to give people a hammer. I want to help them uh, build it and also bring the people to them. So that's that's how I got into helping people in the respect that I'm doing it now. And probably what drives that is I have a personal mission statement that says I want to be the guy who motivates, donates, entertains, educates and inspires. And that's what drives me to do what I'm doing because I can directly do it when I'm working with an audience and I can indirectly do it when I'm helping other people get in front of an audience. And so what I found is passion, though, is the gateway to purpose. So my exercise to help you find your passion, because what my experience has been is if you find something you're passionate about and you do it for long enough, eventually the purpose goes, here I am. It reveals itself. Uh, So the exercise and why I said it's fascinating is because something you said around that. Because not everybody does know these things, and I sometimes take it for granted they do. But what I tell people is to build a list of the things that when you do them, time stands still and you don't watch the clock. What's the thing you think you would do if money was an issue? Like if you could just go all in on this thing. What's the thing that brings a smile to your face? What's the thing that when you were a kid, somebody said, stop doing it, it's not practical, and you stopped? We'll go back to that and say, what was that thing I was doing? And I could go on and on. What's the thing that people tell you that you're really good at? And so what I get people to do is make that list. And they might put things like podcasting. Now, they might just say, I like listening to podcasts. So this is the reason I bring it up. As you said, they might not even know what the what is. So my experience then is you have to get very broad and vague. So it could be like, I like watching NASCAR versus I think I like racing cars because I get speeding tickets all the time. You know, like (laughs) you might have to go deeper. So for some people, they'll be able to say, oh, no, I know what it is. Like, I love playing guitar and I love knitting. I know those are two random ones. Uh, but you might, then here's the thing. When you first decide that I tell people, don't be looking for what's going to pay the bills. And that's the hard part. Cause people say to me, yeah, but how do I make that pay? And I always say, if you're thinking about right from day one, how does this pay? Then it's not your true passion. It's got to be the thing you would do for free if money wasn't an issue. And you should be willing to do it as a side hustle because you enjoy doing it. But, uh, I find that some people can say like, I love reading. I love this. I love that. And they have like four or five hobbies or things they love. And taking those adventures is usually how you find your purpose. And you also how you find out if you're passionate about it, like if you actually are. So what I'll tell people is make a list and then prioritize them by the one that you like the most, you think, and then figure out what are the steps I have to take to take action on this. Now, it might be photography. You might already be doing it. 
but maybe you don't know what you're doing. You're just going out and taking pictures. So then maybe you have to take a photography class. So I get people to go, what are the steps? And then give themselves rewards because then they'll want to keep doing it. And what I find is eventually after you're doing it for a while, the purpose reveals itself. However, you said a key thing, which I don't often mention is what if it's like, what if you don't know it's photography? What if you don't, but it really is those things. And in those cases, you might have to just become very adventurous until you stuck, struck, strike onto something that seems fun. Or you may have to go more vague. Like I said, like I like watching races on TV or I love watching golf or I love playing golf. And again, it might not be that golf is going to pay the bills, but it could be that golf is going to pay the bills. Like you could start playing and then go, whoa, like I'm way better than I thought. And I know people that have never played on like the PGA, but have become the club pro shop trainer or whatever you call it. But the video is at like 6,000 views and I didn't do nothing special. I just recorded this video saying this. What I'm saying is if you take it, if it's, let's say when I, I'm consistent, let's say I go a thousand a day uh, views, let's say. And I think it's been like almost a month. So let's say 30 days. That's what's that 30,000. And then some of them were five, 5,000 views and 4,000 views. Uh, so let's say almost 50,000 people, but I only have, by the way, 300 followers, but 50,000 times people viewed my videos this month just because I got on and I'm talking about a book that we put out. So it's not even like super sexy to me, at your point, every, any angle you look at, there is an audience for you somewhere there. This is something I say to people often because they'll say, well, you know, I, I don't want to do a podcast because, or I start doing a podcast thinking I get this big audience and I'm only getting like let's say a hundred, I'm just saying it loud it, it, early on. It might not even be this many, but let's say a hundred listeners per episode. That's what I'm getting. What's the point of this? And I would, I always say to people, let me ask you this question. If you could walk down the street 10 minutes from now, like walk down the street for 10 minutes, go to a building and speak to your hundred targeted audience. And they listen to you more than they've ever listened to you before. Would you do that? Almost every one of them says every day of the week then why are you turning your back on a hundred people that are in your ear In you're in their ear? They're listening to you in a, in a more intimate way than they ever will from a stage. And you're turning away from that, but it is fascinating people. And I see it over and over again. will jump into podcasting for instance, and think, well, if I don't get 50,000 listeners a month, this isn't worth doing for me. I think it's impact, but what, and I don't, I don't reg like, I don't metric this, but it's like people reaching out to say, you came to my university one time, my college, and you spoke about this. And that gave me the kick in the butt I needed to continue my schooling. And now I manage four or five rental car companies. And that wouldn't have happened without that message you shared that one day. That's the metric for me. Now, it doesn't have to be once a day or once a week. But just having messages like that even randomly come in over time, that's what fuels it for me. So it's not a number. It's just more of a feeling of, wow, I can't believe I did that. And by the way, that's a real one. And I didn't know that. Like, this is like six years later. You know, like, it's crazy to think, too, if you keep doing what you're doing and believe in what you're doing, the, I call it the invisible impact. But the invisible impact you can have on people is far more reaching than you'll ever, ever possibly know. All right. With the top 10 out of the way, I figured I would do some listener questions since we got a couple of those. First up. Do you plan to focus on any topics more in the future? Micah. Thanks, Micah. I have a list of episodes I would personally love to do, including a few that have been requested by audience or in the queue currently. I really want to do a full week or two of everyday shows covering major religions with members of the preaching level. I'm not really sure what the unaligned term is for speakers that get up and inform crowds about worship. And look, I will absolutely get to that and be totally fair to everyone that comes on, but it is so much work to line up that many interviews and do that much editing for such a marathon. I'm estimating we would need to cover about 12 religions with at least an hour apiece for interviews, four hours of editing, plus the interaction time for setup and notification. So without any social media which I know I'm bad at, or publicity work, we're around 72 working hours minimum. Aside from that, uh, let me see here. I have a list I've been jotting down stuff. Uh, conspiracies, paranormal, psychics, generic counseling, Antarctica, space, getting into and being in, a drone pilot, which I know a guy that can hopefully do that one for us, polygamist marriages, being kidnapped and held, ex-Mormon, ex-Scientologist, and witchcraft. 
If you have anything you want to add to that list, shoot us an email or send us a message. I'll be sure to add it to the list and hopefully find someone who can do that for us. Up next, Rocky asks, you had a recent announcement about a medical situation. Can you tell us more? I can, I suppose. Uh, Anyone who listens to me on other podcasts probably knows very well that I used to be a firefighter paramedic for about 12 years before I ever came into podcasting. And I've been super open on those shows about the struggles with PTSD What I haven't really talked about, except for in maybe one of my interviews, is also having a benign brain tumor, and the way that that loves to complicate things. Not to dump all this stuff on you, but it's less than desirable as a combo. I've had a lot of appointments and a couple of brain scans trying to get to the bottom of some troublesome symptoms, but I'm not dying, and I'm not going anywhere. You're all stuck with this professional idiot forever. Next up... How's listenership, Deborah? Well, Deb, between the top three podcast platforms, we have over 2,200 subscribers in 160 countries, with many, many more that are not subscribed, so I would say it's pretty great. The community we have in this audience has always been one of the best parts of my life, and I love seeing it grow like it has. Here's another one from Odilla. I hope I am pronouncing your name correctly. Did something happen to make you happier? Do do I seem happier? (laughs) Honestly, this year hasn't been a great one for me personally with a divorce and an illness, but I wouldn't say it's been bad either. In fact, it's probably been the best year of the last five. But what has changed, and I share this with everyone I talk to outside of the show, I practice what I learn on the show. We had a happiness expert on, and now I do daily gratitude exercises. We had breathing coaches on. I now do breathing exercises. It's taking these little lessons from the show and just incorporating them into your everyday life because they do genuinely make a difference when they all stack up together. All right, now on to some of my favorite reviews and emails we got. Uh, This first one really touched my heart. I really appreciated it. Dear JDE Podcast, It's just dumb enough, J. Depp, as we've been called. Thank you for releasing such unique and fascinating content. Not being largely into podcasts, I find myself oddly intrigued with what the next episode will dive into. Just a few weeks ago, I listened to one where you had a sports-related guest, and they mentioned how physical activity, such as running, helps the mind from overthinking. Because you're so physically exhausted, you can't think deep enough to get overwhelmed in the moment. Being the fool I am, I translated this to jogging intensely on a break later that night, to the point of being uncomfortable. Later, a co-worker was kind enough to invite me on their evening strolls, and that was a much more enjoyable distraction. Sincerely, another dumb fan. And that's the kind of thing I love to hear. You know, obviously don't hurt yourself, don't overextend yourself, but, you know, we all struggle sometimes, and it's perfectly okay to ask for help and seek out others, and like I said just a moment ago, use the things you learn on the show. Just, you know, be safe. I need you guys around. All right, here's another one. Hello, huge fan of the show. Just wanted to send some compliments your way. Live, laugh, love, babes. Cheers. Leo Velour. Love it. Leo, thank you so much for writing in. That really means a lot. And I love to hear from listeners, even if it's just for them to say hey or to share a moment that they think was cool, something that they bonded with a coworker over or, you know, had a neat talk with their mom about or whatever it might be. Now for just a little eco boost, let's look at some public reviews of the show. I love this podcast. I always learn something. I've been listening for some time now and was fortunate to be a guest last year. Keep up the good work, Colton. Dr. Robin Hall. And thank you for coming on the show, Robin. I appreciate having you on here. And it means a lot to have people in the listenership that also want to be on the show. And people who are on the show that also want to be part of the listening community. I think that's great. And it works both ways. And it's fantastic. And I love every second. Next up, Colton Petrie's Just Dumb Enough podcast is, of course, quite smart. All of his shows and guests are wide-ranging and equally fascinating. I find most shows with an international following such as this one are the ones to stalk. This one's a keeper. Best things ever. 
Thanks, best things ever. I appreciate that. And lastly here, Colton ain't no dummy. He's a masterful interviewer who creates the best conversations that you just don't want to end. Jody. Thank you, Jody. I appreciate you as well. Now on to our top 10 countries of the last year. Number one, the United States, led by New York, Oregon, California, Texas, and Illinois. And it was a narrow lead this year as we really saw some ramp up from number two, England and Scotland of the United Kingdom. At number three, Australia's own New South Wales and Victoria. At number four, Canada with Ontario and British Columbia out front. Number five, Ghana, making a huge statement as a regular top five this last year. Number six, New Zealand. Seven, Ireland. Eight, Germany. Nine, South Africa. And ten, India. All ten have had routine time in the tops of the charts. There was only about a 2% difference between number 6 and number 10, and number 11 was way closer than that to getting bumped up the chart. Thank you all again for hanging out with me for my wonderfully dumb show for another year. I hope to have even more fun topics and wild knowledge for you in year 4. That is otherwise it for this week. Have a great week, a great weekend, and I'll see you all back here next week for another new episode. Until that next episode, pretty please remember to do those things that help the show grow, like rating, reviewing, liking, and subscribing. Please, please, please. Remember, you can reach out to dumbenoughpodcast at gmail.com or on any of the social medias if you want to reach me personally. But most importantly, stay dumb.